Have you ever wondered what the school can do to help you get your kid back to school? Well, that's why you need to listen to this episode. Hi, I'm Dr. Roseanne, and I'm a mental health trailblazer. And join me as we have real conversations about real solutions to kids' problems. And today, we're talking about school refusal and what schools can do to help kids and how you can get educational supports in place to help get your kid mentally well again and back to school and loving it. Let's dive in. Welcome back to this ongoing conversation about school anxiety and school refusal. You know it's an ever-growing problem. And when your kid shuts down, you don't know what to do. You're thinking, why can't this kid get on the bus? Why can't he get out of the car when I go to drop them off? You know what? There are a lot of reasons why kids refuse to go to school, and you definitely need to listen to my other episodes. But kids refuse to go to school typically because there's an underlying mental health issue, a social issue, or they're really struggling with attention and learning, and maybe the school's not the right place. So let's talk about 10 strategies to help with school refusal. And this is for parents, but it's for school professionals who are literally drowning in this issue. And this is what I did for 20 something years when I did neuropsych testing and we would work with kids and try to figure out how to get them back to school. This is exactly how I got kids back to school. So number one, assess their needs. What is going on? What does this kid need? Do they need mental health support at home? Of course, you can't pawn it all off on the school, but what can the school do? Maybe it's a different time of day. There has to be some flexibility and there has to be some creativity and ideas. Um, and I know schools are overwhelmed, but we have to look at what a kid needs. Number two, you gotta have a team meeting, okay? So whether that's an IEP or 504 or just a school meeting, You've got to have a meeting. You got to get outside support people there if they're involved. You got to get the parents there. And you got to have a real conversation. At this meeting, I don't like having the student there. Um, certainly, they can be part of the meeting for part of it, but you got to get really into the weeds and figure out what is going on and then come up with a plan that we all agree on. Ideally, school team meetings should be in writing. What are the outcomes? Um, who's monitoring what? What's our timeline? Don't expect a kid to come back to school in a week when there's school refusal. We really want to get to those root causes and really better support those needs. Number three, don't assume you know what the underlying issue is, whether you're the school provider or the parent. You know, it's always so surprising to me, you know, even when we talk about the research about why kids refuse, in there is, you know, one of the reasons is attention-seeking behavior. It's not attention-seeking behavior. This is embarrassing. Kids don't want to not go to school. They want to find a solution to their problem that is making them not want to be in school, whether it's that social issue or learning issue or mental health issue. So let's go in with an open mind. Let's really think about root causes and then solutions with flexibility that schools won't cost them a dime, right? Um, you know, having a safe space with a point person, like a home base, um, shortened school days, um, hybrid programming for a little bit, you know, access to a school council that's already there. So let's look at that. Number four, focus on psychoeducation. Once we've identified the issue, you know, we need to educate school personnel. If you are the parent who has a provider that's helped help them, you want them to really give information that school provider and school providers need to educate parents as to some of these underlying mental health reasons. You know, mental health in, you know, our day and age, we think we talk about all the time. There's still taboos about mental health and struggles, right? And so focusing it on it from a brain perspective, this is what his brain is doing. It's in a freeze mode. Once the brain is in a sympathetic dominant state, 
it's really kind of shut down. So let's talk about ways to calm the brain, then we can change behaviors. It's really in your hands as a professional to educate parents. And parents, once you know, you need to educate professionals. Schools aren't always up to date and it really has a lot to do with what's your experience, right? Um, number five, look at learning and attention needs. It's pretty common for at the point that a kid is shutting down at school, there's a breakdown in learning and attention. There may be a long history of learning and attention problems, but there's gonna be it in the history in some way, shape or form, even if it's just immediate. And so a lot of times kids who are struggling with mental health, they're always gonna have an impact in their learning. So what do we need to support them to ease that? Do we need audio books? Do we need half the assignments? How can we differentiate instruction to help this person not feel so overwhelmed? Um, number six, look at their emotional and coping skills, okay? Clearly, when you're shut down, that's what you know to do, right? And so we assume somebody's maybe a straight A student, um, maybe they're 17, maybe they are, you know, a great big sister. Who knows? You think you have competency in one area, and that means you have competency and coping skills. You know, a lot of kids who are perfectionistic shut down with school. Um, kids with physical issues, like you know, like Lyme disease or pans and pandas. So we don't want to make assumptions. We want to really look at how can we best support them. Number seven, we need to assess, do you need an IEP or a 504? I recently had a case where a kid was like completely shut down. And when I looked at it, it was like a flashing red light case of dyslexia like I was like, say what? <laughs> you mean your kid had reading help between kindergarten and first grade and first grade and second grade and um, and was getting help all the time and like they didn't uh, suggest an IEP ever? No, okay. So, oh, and the uncles both have dyslexia? Okay, you know, uh, really couldn't identify the alphabet until age seven, no IEP in place, guess what? Then, you know, uh, gets to upper elementary and starts refusing school. No surprise there. So we want to look at, is there a need, not just based on the school refusal, but the underlying cause, because that can do a world of good. Okay. Number eight. Okay. Get my fingers up there. We want to create a detailed return plan. Yep. Right out of the gate, we want to create a detailed re return plan. What are the ways we are going to scaffold and make a tiptoe into the pool entry back to school, okay? We're not going to just say, oh, you start on Tuesday. That just doesn't work. Like for some kids, you know, recently had a kid who, you know, had been out of school for a very long time, months and months and months. So it was like, okay, he is a morning person. So <laughs> let's, what do you got in the morning? Likes art great, let's start with art, right? And we just had him go to school in art. And then he was like, did that for a short amount of time. Then we added another one. Then we, added, and the next thing you know, he was there till lunch. Um, so you might have to do it in a tiered step in kind of manner. And that is okay. Please don't feel like it's defeatist because it's not. It's what a person needs when they're in the freeze, fight, flight, or freeze mode in that case, because he's still going to be activated. She's going to still be anxious. We want to make sure that we have a detailed report return plan that is clear to the child, is clear to the school, clear to the parents. Whatever is in that plan needs to be laid out. Um, and you need to have buffers of time and sensitivity um, because it's better to do it with scaffolding than to have another failure. Um, number <laughs> Number nine, create safe exposures. That's the same thing that we're talking about in our detailed plan. So we want to have it where we're not just throwing the kid back, but we're giving them small amounts so that whatever irrational fear is going on, whatever phobia, whatever level of activation, you build in success and the subconscious brain says, I can do this. I can do this. I did that. Now I can stay longer. That's what exposure is all about. Ten reinforce desired behaviors you want, right? We're not going to penalize our kids. We're not going to punish them. This is not, you're, you're, if, if punishment made kids 
go back to school who were refusing to school, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. <laughs> um, what we want to do is reinforce and shape desired behaviors. So that's coping with stress, right? So every time your child is like coping with stress, you know, and this is a 17 year old, this is a four year old, this is all the things in between. Um, and then we want to make sure that we are also reinforcing their attempts to go back to school, their attempts for educational learning, um, their successful things of educational learning, and ask questions like, that was really hard for you, and you did it. How did you do it? Right? And it gets them to really see, see that success model. If a kid doesn't make it, you just say, okay, we got tomorrow. Okay, let's take a deep breath. What else can you do right now, right? Instead of like your kid being like, forget it, and it be another point of friction. So those are my 10 best ways, the strategies to help school refusal, getting our kids back, you know, concentrate on mental health, follow your providers, um, treatment recommendation, and focus on mental health. When you focus on mental health and really therapy, and not duct tape in this because it's just going to fall apart if you duct tape it. You got to get to the root causes. Then you need that right treatment at the right time. And your school refusal will be something in the past because your kid will have good mental health and that will help he or her through what they're going through right now, but it also builds that foundation for good mental health for the future.